everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mi Plus Plus seminar, the first one in the new year 2024. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Daniel Fusen from the uh, University of Tübingen in Germany, who will talk about galaxy of periodic tilings. Over to you, Daniel. Please. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, so this talk is—I don't. Need, this talk has got four parts. I'm going to—I'm going to start oh. off with some uh, some uh, results in topology, and then I'm going to move on to geometry, and then there's going to be some combinatorics, and then uh, we get down to algorithms and software. So that's quite a generic structure, and. We will see what, what's hidden behind these four topics. So I'm going to start with, uh, I don't know, is that black? I'll move this black bar out of the way. Uh, I'm going to start with an old result from topology. Uh, it has to do with uh, the classification of closed surfaces. So if you look at orientable closed surfaces, then uh, the, the sphere is an example of that. And so that's one uh, possible uh, sequence. Uh, uh, Surface, and I'm going to introduce a notation that John Conway proposed in this context. So he called this one, or the notation for the sphere is one. And the torus is another example of an orientable closed surface. And in, in Conway's notation, that's called ring. And then you can imagine the torus with, you know, with two handles, that would be ring ring, or you could have H handle. So in Conway's notation, that's H rings. And what about non-orientable closed surfaces? Well, take a sphere, punch a hole in it, and then take a Möbius strip that we all like, at least from school days, and then identify, uh, you know, Möbius strip has one boundary component, and along that boundary, uh, glue that into the sphere, get the connected sum, and what you get is a sphere with a cross cap on it. Now, this is not a good picture of a cross cap. It's a slightly better picture, and yeah, but I'm going to draw them just as one of those crosses. So whenever... So whenever you see one of those circles with a cross in it, it's one of those uh, glued in Möbius strips. And so that's also that if you think about it, it's a, it's a projective plane and in Conway's notation that's called cross. If you take two cross caps, and this is not immediately obvious, at least not to me, that this is the same as the Klein bottle. And then in Conway's notation, that's two crosses. And then you can imagine you have three cross caps and so on, K cross caps, so K crosses in Conway's notation. And so an old result that goes back to 1860s uh, is that any connected closed surface is either a sphere or one in Conway's notation, a sphere with H handles, ring, 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 or a sphere with K cross caps, okay? And uh, one of the, so, and, but you've noticed there was nothing that had both cross caps and spheres. And that's because uh, if you, in a non-orientable surface, whenever you have a handle, you can replace it by two cross caps. So there's a kind of a two for one deal. Uh, and so you can, so if you've got this surface on the left with a cross cap and three handles, that's the same as having, saying I've got a surface with seven cross caps. And I naively, the way I think of that is if I take uh, the foot of one of those tori that's stuck to that sphere and move it through that cross cap, I come out the other side and it's kind of the way that the, the torus is glued together has been reversed. And so it's, and it's like a, it, then it's like a Klein bottle. Yeah, so, you know, a Klein bottle is a bit like a, a cross cap, but you cut it open and stuck it back in a reverse orientation. Yeah, so what about surfaces with boundaries? Well, you can punch holes into a sphere and their hole in Conway's notation is represented by a star. And you can do that to say this double torus here. And so then you would have ring ring for the two handles and then four stars for the four holes that have been punched into the surface. Yeah, and you can do, uh, yeah. So we have surfaces with boundary is, uh, if I punch a hole into, into a sphere with a cross cap, and I get back, I get the, I get, I'm back at the Möbius strip. And so we can uh, extend that previous theorem and say that any connected surface closer with boundary is either a sphere, so it has notation one, or it's a sphere with uh, B disks removed, or it's 
a sphere with handles and B disks removed. Okay, so that's all nice stuff, and it's you know goes back to over a hundred years. Uh, yeah. Oh, you. Oh, sorry, I forgot this one here. Sphere with K cross cuts and B disks removed. Okay, now so more. You know, let's move on to more recent concepts. So that of a, a, an obifold, uh, so an, uh, a coin, I think, uh, a term coined by uh, Bill Thurston. And so here's, a, here's one of those surfaces again with a Conway notation. Now, uh, one way to think of obifold is I take one of these surfaces and I'm allowed to add a finite set of points with labels, uh, integer labels of two or more. So here I've just added a bunch of points. Some of them are in the interior of the surface and uh, some are on boundary on the on a boundary component, and so in Conway notation, I list all the you list all the the points that are in the surface uh, before any crosses, and then for each uh, for any star, so you know, each boundary component behind the corresponding star, you list the numbers that occur on that boundary component in the order that they occur in. So you have to, you know, so in this case it's two four two four, and it's not four four two two or something. And if you have numbers on multiple boundary components and the surface is orientable, then they all have to be listed you know, in the same direction. So always go positively round. If, if, if the surface is non-orientable, then uh, you can do different things on different components. Okay, so that's one way to uh, introduce obifolds. There's a bit more to them than just some points but we, the main feature is going to be these points. And we're going to call a point a gyration point if it's in the interior of the surface and a corner point if it's on the boundary. Yeah, and so an obifold is a space that looks locally Euclidean, except at these special points where it looks like the quotient of a Euclidean space by a finite group of isometry. So the gyration points are going to be the centers of rotational symmetry when we get to symmetry groups and so on. There are going to be images of those. And then the corner points are going to be correspond to dihedral symmetries and the boundary components are going to come, are going to come from uh, mirror symmetries. So we, uh, so, so you can describe one of these objects using the Conway notation and actually like Beef already had a notation, not as slick as a Conway notation, but basically the same content. So you might want to, you know, so I could call it the Conway McBeef uh, notation. In any case, so you list any handles that your surface might have, unless it has cross caps and you only list the cross caps and then gyration points and then the boundary components with their corners, if they have any. So this is called the obifold notation. It describes an obifold, uh, some features of an obifold. And, if it, uh, yeah, and then there's a special case of the sphere, which is described as one. Okay, so that's all I was gonna, sorry, yeah. That's all I was gonna say about topology. Yeah, please ask. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so since I finished in one section, I uh, could ask, uh, do we still consider all the surfaces with uh, points um, inside on the boundary still under homeomorphism? What, what's the main equivalence relation? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yes, you would uh, map them. I mean, uh, what we, yeah, what we'll be looking at later when we look at tilings, it will be preserving, yeah, we'll be looking at the equivalent up to homeomorphism and not, not, not anything beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. Why do you see two types of corners uh, in this particular um, example string? Why, uh, sorry, here, this, why is there A, yeah. B, C? And, and that's just, that was just to show that, you know, between, behind different styles, you might have different numbers or might not have any numbers. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so this was like three, five, seven is the one beyond, the, you know, yeah, so, there is no difference between ABC and RPQ. They just supposed to represent different possible numbers that may or may not appear. Ah, so these yeah. stars could could be put in into any place. Yeah, uh, no, sorry. Uh, with this, a star is accompanied with uh, some corner points or none. So you know, each each star is a boundary component, and if there are if there's I corner see. points on that right. boundary component, you yeah. have to list them together with the star. So the so mm -hmm. the stars, but then there's uh, Conway didn't really specify the notation beyond that so which order you put the stars together with the numbers is is not fixed okay. yeah. yeah so thank you for your clarification yeah. if anyone else has questions here yeah please yeah please go ahead and ask 
questions. There will be examples of in the in the next. You know, this will become more concrete uh, in the in the next section, hopefully. Yeah. So geometry. So we'll be talking about symmetry groups, and then these orbifolds arise as uh, uh, the quotients of uh, right symmetry groups. So let's start off with uh, objects of the real world, like a, a rectangular table. Imagine a perfectly rectangular table and enclose it in a sphere and then look at the symmetries of the sphere that, that map the table onto itself, that preserve the table. So in a re rectangular table, if we look at this more carefully, we will see that uh, uh, if we identify points on, on the sphere base uh, uh, with respect to group uh, symmetries of the table, then we we will have a on the right you see this uh, this one quarter of a sphere where points in this in the interior of this surface have four pre images. Uh, so this point here, I don't, I don't can you see my mouse? Oh, can you see that I'm moving a mouse around? Yeah. Okay. So that point here has four pre images: x x prime, x double prime. Yeah, and so on. And then the points along the boundary have two pre-images and then the top and the bottom is only one pre-image. And so this is uh, the, the surface, uh, the quotient topology space of the orbits uh, if you apply the symmetry group of the table to the sphere. And there's a two-fold rotation or dihedral symmetry going through the, the top and the bottom. And there's reflectional reflections along these uh, these. Uh, edges here. And so if you think about what the that quotient space looks like, it's a it's a disk with uh, two two points. So the orbifold is a disk with two points on it, something that we have drawn like this in the previous section. So yeah. And the orbifold notation is star two two and that's all yeah so this describes that orbifold that you get by identifying points by this uh, with respect to the symmetry group, and it also it provides us with a name for the symmetry group. That's the orbifold name for this particular symmetry group, star 2-2. Two, two. There's one boundary component and there's two different uh, corner points on it. Here's another example. Imagine this tiling, uh, you know, uh, extended uh, across the whole of the, of the Euclidean plane. There are some symmetries. These, these orange lines uh, indicate some uh, reflectional symmetries. And if you have this little orange region in the middle, that's the fundamental domain for this symmetry group. That's the smallest domain that you, you, know, by, you can take and you know, apply the symmetry group to such that you get the whole tiling. And uh, there are four dihedral centers, uh, rotational centers 180 degrees that have reflection going through them on the boundary of this uh, fundamental region. And uh, they give rise to, so this gives rise to a, an orbifold that's a sphere with a hole punched out and one component, and there's four twos on that. If you look at the, these twos carefully, you can see that each of them is on a located in a different place in the tiling. One's in the center of the octagon, one's in the center of a, a rectangle, and so on. So they're non equivalent two fold rotational centers. And so the symmetry group that cause the, the, the symmetry group of this tiling is called star two 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 in Con Conway notation. Another example here's a tiling again. Uh, there's uh, like reflectional symmetries are going, shown in orange. You can see there's a threefold rotation around the center here. It's not dihedral. I mean, there's no reflections going through that. There's another threefold center here which has the uh, reflections going in. So this three is going to end up on a boundary component. This one's going to end up in the interior of the corresponding orbifold. Yeah. Daniel, and that would be the, yeah, the groups three, star three. Yeah, yep. Could right. you clarify? So, so you draw it in as, as a sphere with a removed uh, open disk, uh, but yeah. in, in, in a different, well, in an equivalent way, we could consider it um, as a topological disk. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah that's there, right. Yeah, I could have just drawn a drawn a disk. No need to draw a, a sphere with a hole punched out. You're yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So, so this sh shaded area um, with brown area is is like topological disk. Yeah. So that brown area, if I identified 
uh, along that dotted line, if I if I if I glued it along this dotted line, uh, then then I would get then I would get a disc with this this would be then the boundary. Yeah, so that's yeah. So there's a rotational symmetry that maps this boundary component onto that one, and so yeah, as a quotient space, those would be identified, and then what would remain is this boundary component here. Yeah. Yeah, so I could have drawn I, should, I could draw a dotted line from the three to this boundary component on this disk, and that would correspond to this here. Yeah. Daniel, could you clarify? So why do we identify these two dashed arcs? Why do I identify? Uh, sorry, the the dotted arc. Yeah, the dotted arcs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's a three there's a threefold rotational symmetry around this center yeah. here. The, mm -hmm. wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit hard to see because of the colors, but the, this triangle up here is equivalent to that one. And this one, this thing down here is equivalent to that. So there is a symmetry that rotate, if I rotate all the way around, uh, the, yeah, these, these lines get, they, they're, they get identified with each other with respect to the, the symmetry group. So what's inside, so inside this orange region, that's a fundamental domain. This is the smallest region that you need to cover the whole tiling if by applying symmetries to it. And uh, yeah. And you get the orbifold by uh, identifying points along the boundary that can be mapped onto each other by some symmetry. There's a symmetry that rotates this dotted line onto this dotted line around here. And so they're equivalent. So, so, so this, the orbifold is like, yeah, it's a quotient space, uh, any point, Two points in this uh, tiling get mapped to the same point in the in the orbifold if there's a symmetry that maps the one onto the other. So there's a symmetry that maps any this these guys along here onto these guys along here. So in the in the quotient space, they appear as one point. So that's why they're identified. And yeah, anybody out here is identified with a point in here. Anyone along this boundary component is identified uh, with itself because it's a, it's a, there's a reflection of symmetry along here that just maps the, the points onto themselves. Just that. So could I check any points on the horizontal yeah. black edge? Are they identified or not in this example? These points? Yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah but they're, who, who's this guy? They're, they're identified. There's a... The, the big fat black edges here uh, indicate boundary components of the fundamental domain that are along a, a reflection of symmetry. Reflection symmetry means that you get, if you're on that axis of reflection symmetry, you get mapped onto yourself. I, I mean, yeah, you get, I'm yeah, you're, 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 you're on the edge of a, a reflection. So yeah, there's no additional gluing to be done. This is different here because it's, it's a rotational symmetry. This gets rotated over to here. Oh, sorry. I've lost my tiling. Okay. Here we are. Yeah. And for the vertical line uh, through this one here? Yes. Uh, there is no reflection. No. Yeah, there, this is yeah. There's no there's no symmetry here. Uh, yeah, I've the way that I've chosen this fundament, yeah, there, there is no symmetry here. Yep. Mm -hmm. You can see there's the, there's a triangle on the one side of the line, and this is a full. Uh, each tile on the other side. So there's no way that a symmetry is going to map the one tile onto the other tile. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. There's more examples, so hopefully <laughs> make it more clear. So here's, an, here's, an, here's a brick, you know, imagine bricks covering the, the whole of the plane. And then again, looking for symmetries, there's a, there's a reflection of symmetry that goes through a, any layer of bricks. I've drawn one of them here. There's another one going through the next layer and the next layer and so on. And there's also a uh, reflection of symmetry going down here and down here. And now to figure out what the orbifold is, we first have to identify a fundamental domain, the smallest region that suffices to get the whole uh, to cover the whole plane if we apply symmetries to it. So it's this region here. And then there's a reflectional symmetry along here, here, and here. So that's going to lead to boundary components in the orbifold. And here there's a two-fold rotation. So that's going to be a similar situation where all the points here get ad identified with all the points here. And that, so this is going to be enclosed in 
So you're going to get this, basically. This is going to be in, uh, enclosed. Uh, it's going to be in the interior. So we identify points along points along here with points along here. And then uh, everything else is on the boundary component like this. And there's these two twos. This is in the center of a brick, and this is in a, in the center in a gap between bricks. So these are two. These are definitely different two-fold rotation of symmetry centers. They're not equivalent. Uh, we will see an example in a moment where you think, oh, there's there's multiple rotational centers, but if you look more closely, you'll see actually they they are just different instances of the same equivalence class. Yeah. Which. Uh, is that is that is that Nikolai Dorbilin or who is that? Oh, yeah. Yes, Nikolai. Nikolai Petrovich is here. Wow, that's amazing. Daniel, hello. Hi. It's nice to see you. Oh, it's Sorry. nice to see you. <laughs> Very good to see you. Thank you. I will, uh, you too. I will tell Elke that I saw you. She'll be so jealous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. How, is she? How is she? She's fine, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I should get back to the talk. We can discuss okay. later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm yes. sorry, uh, Daniel, which groups do you consider here, but in this example? Only of the uh, identification preserved or, uh, or also of the second order? Which group is yeah. here? Yeah. So, uh, we, so this has reflections in it. So there's, there's no, no there's reflections that. here. Yeah, there's a reflection here. Ah, yeah, from this axis ah, yeah, and I here see. and there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are reflections here, mm -hmm. and so this. But yeah, so this turns out to be the group two because it's a twofold rotation that does not have a reflection going through it, and it mm -hmm. ends up as a point inside the orbifold. And then there's these two non-equivalent twos here. So they and they're on the same boundary component. So this is the group two star two two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. So there is uh, order reversing, and there will, there's an example coming up where there's where the group is also not oriented, uh, and there are no reflections. So it has glide reflections. Yeah. Thank you. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Move on to the next. Yeah. So ah here. Oh, no, this has uh, reflections along this line here. Uh, along these two. And then here, what we have going up, we go from one copy of the fundamental domain to the next copy here, it's a glide reflection. We kind of flip over to the other. So that's what these arrows are supposed to identify, indicate as we move upwards, it's a glide reflection. And that's where those cross caps come from in the orbifold. Whenever there's a, a glide reflection in the symmetry group, it leads to a cross cap. And uh, there's only one boundary component. I've drawn two lines here, but the as uh, a, a glide reflection going upwards is going to map this reflection or symmetry onto that one. Daniel, uh, is it possible to choose a different fundamental domain? Yes, sorry, yeah, this is, yeah, there, there is usually many different ways to choose a fundamental domain. And we will get to that when we get to the combinatorics, that will become very clear there. Here it's a bit, it's uh, it's a bit harder to see, but it, when we do the combinatorics, you'll see. Oh, yeah, there's many ways to choose a fundamental domain, so that will become clearer. Here's a, here's a here's a situation where there's only a glide reflections. There's no uh, so it's a non-orientable group uh, symmetry group. Things get flipped over. You can see this kind of a uh, five-sided tile. You see there's a there's a there's a left-handed and uh, a right-handed version. So things do get flipped over. Yeah, and the two independent glide reflections give you two cross caps. Uh, let's move on to hyper, uh, hyperbolic. It's a similar game. You look for a fundamental domain here. So this is a bit like Escher's angels and devils. And so you see the feet of three angels coming together here with the feet of three devils and so on. And uh, there's a reflection of symmetry going through here. So on, on this fundamental domain, I've already drawn a fat line to indicate that this is going to be, this can give rise a boundary component because it's, there's a reflection of symmetry going along here. But there's again, in one of these dotted lines here and here. So when we go over to the OB fold, we're going to identify these points with these points. So, you know, because there's a rotational symmetry around here. And so we get something that looks like this. So there's a four fold rotation around this point where four angels and four devils 
uh, touch with their, the tips of their wings. And then there's a threefold rotation at the feet of the angels. And now there's another threefold over here, but it, you have to be careful because here you see it's, it's also at the feet of the angels. So that doesn't give us a second three on the boundary component, it's the same three. So these are actually, and yeah, if you think about it, uh, I already said that these lines get identified with each other. In particular, this point is gonna be identified with that point. It gives rise to one point here in the, yeah. So it's the same, it's an equivalent rotational symmetry. Uh, and that's going to be, and this is called four star three. So the nice thing about these names, you know, these Conway orbifold names, is that they they contain in, the, you know, they look like names. You know, four star three it looks like a name to anybody, but it's not. But it's, but it has that additional nice feature that you can actually see in the name. You can figure out what the group is without having to look up something in a table. You know, this is actually a full description of what the symmetry group is. It has this orbifold, and you can figure out, okay, if it's, this is the orbifold, then the group has to be this. Okay, so we saw that uh, if we had enough time, or, you, know, you could draw, yeah, I mean, you can draw a picture and then figure out what the symmetries are and come up with a name. So going from some sy symmetric situation to the orbifold name is, with a bit of practice, is, is easily possible. Uh, but the mathematically, you could also ask the other question, okay, if I just write down, if I just make up an orbifold name, you know, I don't know, some zeros, some numbers, some stars, and some other numbers, uh, is there always a symmetry group that corresponds to it? Can I always get this as the action of a symmetry group uh, on, uh, on the plane, the sphere of a hyperbolic plane? And, and the theorem goes, yeah, if, if I make up a name, it can be obtained as the quotient of uh, the sphere and an orthogonal group or the Euclidean plane and crystallographic group, or a hyperbolic plane and a non-Euclidean crystallographic group. In most cases, except for this, the, the four so-called so bad orbifolds that do not correspond to a symmetry group, cannot be obtained by a symmetry group. So for anything you can make up, anything you can dream up, you can put 100 rings there, followed by 99, 5006, and 33, there's a symmetry that corresponds to a symmetry group. The only thing you're not allowed to do is one of these combinations. Uh, and so the, the P, I guess, is called the teardrop orbifold. So that would be a sphere with one P-fold rotation in it. And naively to understand why that can't work is you, you think of a, a, a symmetry of the sphere, a symmetry group acting on the sphere where you have one rotational center. Well, there's always gonna be the antipole on the other side, if there's a five-fold rotation at one point, there's going to be a five-fold rotation uh, antipodal to it. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to work. And so, so that's why, the, and then P and Q, you can't have a five-fold rotation on one side on the north pole of the sphere and a six-fold on the other, on the south pole. So if you've got a, a symmetry group uh, or an orbifold PQ, then P and Q have to be equal. Yeah. Yeah. Question about that? Yeah, Daniel. Uh, so this is the important theorem, right? So could I clear? Yeah. Uh, it can be interpreted as a classification of these quotient spaces up to homeomorphism. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. And that's and that's and that's, and that's, that's the that's why the obi and yeah the, and that's why the orbifold notation is uh, uh, a useful notation with symmetry groups. Because it describes it up to homeomorphism. Yeah. So two quotient spaces from from this list are homeomorphic if and only if they have the same uh, orbifold symbol. Yeah. Yep. And the same, you know, there's same. Yeah, you know, there's some rearranging of the stars and so on. But but yeah. So not exactly the same. Not literally the indeed, same. But there's, indeed, uh, up, there's up some, to some. some uh, yeah. Up to some uh, simple equivalences. So yeah, that's right. Up, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we're going to we're going to home in on periodic tilings as a nice way, uh, you know, uh, structure that co where, where symmetry groups play a, a role. So this is, yeah, this will, this is, and here are just some examples where you can see the orbifold notation. Uh, you can see that the the, the, the 
the, uh, the notation works nicely for all three geometries. So you can use it, yeah. And you can see that, no, is it? Yeah. So you can see that if you go from star 532 to star 632, you, the, the corresponding uh, geometry changes from uh, spherical to Euclidean. Uh, if I go from 632 to 642, star 642, then I've got something hyperbolic. So, so is yeah. So you can move seamlessly back and forth between the three geometries. So we're going to get so let's get into combinatorics. So now we're going to talk about periodic tilings and how they can be described in such a way that we can classify tilings. And so the, the, the key uh, concept here is that of an equivariant tiling. So what's an equivariant tiling? It consists of a tiling, which consists of tiles uh, that come together uh, uh, along uh, connected uh, boundary components, which we call edges or uh, single points that we call uh, vertices. And, uh, yeah, and everything's well behaved. There's no you know, infinite stuff going on anywhere on the boundary or whatever. We will get back to that in a moment. And equivariant means in this particular case is that we take a tiling and we, we prescribe the symmetry group. So one way you could proceed is just to say, okay, I've got, I've got a set of tiles and the symmetry group is the full set of symmetries of, that, of those tiles. You know, so the ones that you can see for this particular tile, imagine this uh, you know, infinitely extended in all directions then there would be uh, the, you know, the, the largest possible symmetry group of this tiling. You could call that the symmetry group of the tiling, but we're gonna, we, equivariant tiling is you fix the tiles and you can, uh, you can take the full set of symmetries or you're allowed to take a subgroup. So you, you say, okay, you could, for example, here I could say, I want the, those tiles, but I only want the non, I only want those reflections that do not change the orientation. So I'm gonna ignore all reflections. Then I've got three-fold rotations, six-fold rotations, two-fold rotations, but I don't have any reflection. So I'm allowed to choose a smaller uh, group. So I prescribe the symmetry group. It can be the full symmetry group, but it could be a smaller one. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about how do we capture the essence of such a tiling together with the symmetry group. And uh, so one way to think of this is uh, to use the concept of barycentric subdivision, but there's a number of equivalent ways but we'll start with this one because it's the easiest one to imagine. So we take the tiling and we put a set, we do a barycentric subdivision. We choose the center of each tile and connect it to the, each vertex of the tile and all the edge centers. Uh, another way to think of this is as a set of flags. Uh, those are triples, a face containing an edge, containing a vertex. So V contained in E, contained in F, or there's people describe these in, in terms of chamber systems. Uh, as well, but basically, yeah, we triangulate uh, so uh, in such a way that one tri any triangle goes from the center of a face to the center of an edge and to a vertex. Okay, and now we look at these triangles under the operation of the symmetry group. And so here we're taking the full symmetry group. And so what I've done here is I've num put numbers and things if they're equivalent with respect to the symmetry group. And so you can see here now that they're. In this particular example, there are four symmetry uh, equivalence classes of, of triangles in the barycentric subdivision. Uh, but it, yeah. And now to, to get back to the question of uh, how free are we when we choose a fundamental subdivision, basically but, uh, a fundamental domain, sorry. To make a fundamental domain, we have to choose, take one triangle from each class. So we need one, 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 two, one, three, and one, four. And we could do that in you know, a number of different ways. We can take these guys here, uh, or we can go this one, yeah, there's not that much choice, I guess. Uh, yeah, and this we kind of, this one's also not, yeah, there's not that much choice in this one because of the reflections. But in general, what you need to do once you've got the barycentric subdivision and the uh, formed uh, equivalence classes with respect to the symmetry group to get a fundamental domain, you need one triangle from each equivalence class. And that can usually be done in uh, a number of different ways. Well, here you can see I could take these four, I could take four over here, I could take four over there, and so on. Yeah, okay, so to, and so, and here's a choice of uh, four triangles. This is a fundamental domain uh, for, the, for the symmetry group. If I apply all sym symmetries to this, I get exactly the whole tiling. 
And I'm gonna re represent each of these equivalence classes as a node in a graph. Okay, so there's four triangles, so there's four nodes. The no I've, I've numbered them here for our convenience, but that's not part of the graph. It's just to, so that we can see the equivalence. Uh, okay, and uh, so a graph is gonna, each node is gonna have, uh, gonna be adjacent to three edges and these edges are gonna tell us, you know, who are the neighbors uh, of that particular, the corresponding triangle. So there's a, there's a, and there's gonna be three types of edges, depending on, if you think about the, the flag, flags, what flag component, what dimensional flag com component have, do I have to exchange to get from the one triangle to the other? So the, the yellow and the green, they differ only by the, the vertex, the zero dimensional element. They have the, they're in the same tile, they're adjacent to the same edge, but they have a different vertex. So there's a zero edge between those two guys. Make sense? And then uh, these two guys, they share the same two dimensional uh, element. They're both in the same tile. They are adjacent to the same zero dimensional element, the same vertex, but they are on a different edge. The one dimensional thing has changed. So there's a, so if I, if I, if I leave a triangle of type one, over the, the thing connecting uh, the one dimensional edge, I, I end up in the same class. And the third choice is uh, I keep the same vertex, keep the same edge, but jump to the other tile and, and, I, and I land up in number two. Okay, now I can do the same for this guy. Uh, if I cross over, if I exchange the zero element component, I stay in the same class. If I exchange the adjacent, edge, I come into class three, and then from class three, I can get to four, and for four, exchanging the vertex or exchanging the edge, I always stay in the same equivalence class of triangles, only if I jump over the two, if I change the two-dimensional element of the flag, do I get into the other class. So this is telling us how the different classes are related to each other. There's four equivalence classes of triangles and biocentric subdivision, and this is how they are uh, related to each other. That's one thing that we have to record. The other thing that we have to record is for each one of these classes, something about the ge geometry of the tiling. So for, for any, we, we record two numbers, the face degrees and the vertex degrees of the, of the tiling. So triangles of class number one, they're inside a, a hexagon. This tile has six uh, edges. And uh, then, and they're adjacent to a node of degree four. There's four edges going into here, so this is six four. This guy over here is contained in a, a tile with four edges, so there's a four, but it's also adjacent to a, a vertex of degree four, so it's a four. This is also a four and a four. It's in the same tile, and then this is going to be three and four because it's a, it's in a triangle, but everyone's adjacent to the same type of node, so that's. Okay, so that's, now this is a complete description uh, that we, this is, uh, this is what's called the Delaney dress symbol. It's, uh, you can describe it. And so Andreas Dress came up with this idea. He was inspired by Matthew Delaney, uh, who, yeah, who, yeah, I guess inspired Andreas to come up with this idea. And so this is called the Delaney dress symbol. And we think of it as a graph, but, but you can also think of it as a finite set with a with a with a, a group of involutions acting on it. But we're not going to pursue that path in this talk. And why do we care about this particular construct? Uh, because two periodic tilings are equivalent, if and only if the Delaney dress symbols are uh, isomorphic, and equivalent in the sense that there's a homeomorphism that maps the tile, the one tiling onto the other, and preserves this. The, the pre prescribed symmetry group. So you've got the same, you got topologically the same tiles and you have uh, a symmetry group that acts on them in a, in, a, in a compatible way, in the same way. Yeah, so if you want, and so if your interest is to uh, classify certain types of tilings, you can address that by uh, concentrating on the corresponding Delaney dress symbols on these graphs. So to enumerate certain tilings with certain properties, enumerate the corresponding graphs with the corresponding properties. Yeah. Uh, Daniel. Um, yeah. So I thought that here ge geometry became more important, but we are still considering tilings up to homeomorphism. 
Yeah. Yeah. So the geometry only comes uh, with with symmetry group. With yeah, with well, there's group. symmetry group here. Yeah. So the so the symmetry groups are, are present. Yeah. But okay. yeah. And, and here you can see the single homeomorphism. It's not a continuous deformation of one talent into another. No, it's not necessarily. Mm -hmm. No, it's just one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So I want I want to talk about these uh, this this representation of for for a couple of minutes. Uh, what can you read off of this symbol? So, okay, so we've seen that if we're interested in periodic tilings, we can uh, focus on these Delaney dress symbols. And there are some simple properties that you can read off. For example, if you want to know how many equivalence classes of tiles are there in the tiling, well, as long as you don't use one of these edges labeled two, which took you from, which exchanged the tile that your triangle is contained in, you're going to stay in the same tile. So, so if you look at the graph and consider the zero one components, the connected components that you get if you did, if you ignore any edges that are labeled two, you see there's one here, there's a second one here, and then there's a third one here. So the number of zero one components tells you how many equivalence classes of tiles there are. And so, uh, yeah, and, the, and so this corresponds to this hexagon. This connected component can corresponds to this rectangle, and this one uh, to this three sided tile. And then similar things for the number of edges, the number of vertices, the equivalence classes, of edges of vertices. As long as you don't exchange the one dimensional component of a flag, you're always gonna stay uh, on the same edge. And so the zero two components, uh, there's one here, there's two of those. So that means there's gonna be two equivalence classes of edges in the tiles. And you can see there's the one that separates uh, the red from the white tiles. And then there's the edges that separate the blue from the white and that's all there is. So that, this is some very simple properties that you can read off this graph uh, that tell you something about the tiling. There's, a, there's some more advanced properties. Uh, for example, uh, you can look at that graph and you can figure out what the geometry is that the tiling is going to be uh, realized in. So whether it's going to be Euclidean, hyperbolic, or spherical, you can figure out the curvature of the geometry. So that's something that you know, tells you something about the number of elements in the group if it's uh, spherical and something about how fast the tiling, the tiles, you know, something about the tiling in hyperbolic. Uh, you can figure out the orbifold name from that graph. So it's a very, it can, yeah, it can, it's, a, it's a useful way of describing these tilings. Daniel, could I clarify, if you change your fundamental domain to another one, we get an yeah. isomorphic graph, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the choice of, yeah, the choice of uh, the fundamental domain is, uh, is not going to change the graph. Mm -hmm. Because you can, cause basically, uh, in this picture, this is not a very good picture because we can't, there's not that many choices, but you know, I, I can choose to make it under the mental domain. I have to choose one triangle of each type, and then the neighborship, you know, the neighbor. You know, I've got. You know, that's not going to change uh, how things are connected with each other because that's a local uh, relationship. Any one is always going to have a one and a two and another one as its neighbors, and also these these invariants that we added are not going to change either. Yeah, so the. There's a lot of freedom of choosing the fundamental domain, but it doesn't change the graph. The graph is independent of that. Daniel, on the previous slide, uh, with subdivision into triangles, is yeah. it unique? Sorry? Uh, sure, say sure. that again? Unique. Subdivision unique. into triangles. Is it unique? Yes. No. I mean, yeah. well, so the biocentric subdivision, if, if like in this, if everything's convex and so on, then it, it all works nicely. But then, but, the, but then, but then we also have that other, that equipment. You know, I said that you could also consider those flags, and this that's unique. That is unique. You know, certain time is always going to be, yeah. So yeah, so the, yeah, so in a, so this flag description, I uh, say that you know these triplets of a vertex within an edge within the face that's going to be unique. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you so if you think of biocentric, yeah. So biocentric subdivision is 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 unique. Yeah. It might not be uh you can't use it if the tiles are you know uh, severely non-convex then it might happen that the biocenter doesn't lie inside the tile and so on and so the and that at some point uh so that might not work and then and that's when you that's when you want to yes, yes, move over to the the flag representation or have a biocentric subdivision that's you know not a, that's a kind of topological one one that, yeah, the, the key thing about a biocentric subdivision, the triangles have to, uh, you know, uh, respect this. They have to be compatible with the symmetry group. So, yeah, it doesn't really have the biocentric subdivision as long as edges are, whether the yeah, as long as it, it plays nicely with the symmetry group. So, if there's a reflection going along the edge of a bio, uh, one of these triangles, it has you know the, the edge has to be on that reflectional uh, line. All tiles here are polygonal, right? Simple polygons. Yeah, so you can have uh, vertices that will uh, that come around and touch. You can have a tile that comes around and where uh, that shares a vertex with itself. So that can happen, and that's still described by this graph. So it, it doesn't make it so the the tiles can come around and you know, they can share an edge with themselves. You know, there can be a little island of stuff in the middle. And the tile can come around and mm -hmm. uh, connect with itself. Okay, that so ba boundary arcs could be curves, not necessarily straight. Yeah, lines. not not straight. Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, we don't make use of straightness here. I mean, everything has to. Yeah, we don't make. Yeah, the edges don't have to be straight. And we will. Yeah, we will see that uh, later. That there's a there's quite a lot of uh, room to maneuver in terms of what the shape of the edges are. Okay, so yeah. these subdivisions are in, in the topological sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Subdivision in the topological sense uh, uh, has to be compatible with the symmetry group. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I uh, ask about yeah. your labeling of uh, the zero, one, two? I, yeah. I think I might have worked it out because we've got the VEF ordering. And for each yeah. one, you you reflected across the edge opposite the VEF zero one two. Is that relevant? Yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So uh, the edge zero means if you think of the flags, you're exchanging the zero dimensional component. Is is that your question? So yeah. So yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So so exchanging. I get. I, yeah. So from this, from I get to this guy over here. By exchanging the two dimensional, if I go from, if I go from one, oh yeah, I guess this is a picture. So I get from here to here because it's the zero dimensional thing that's changed. It's this, the flag consists of a, an edge, a, no, a vertex within an edge within a face, and so this vertex is now this one over here. Mm -hmm. so the, the edge is still the same, and the face is still the same. Yeah. So by exchanging the zero dimensional, uh, where do I? So the to draw the green edge, I ask, I have to ask myself, so which equivalence class do I do I land in? If I if I exchange uh, you know, if I change the zero dimensional uh, mm -hmm. element, in this case I land in the same, and then and if I change the one, yeah, same vertex, same face, different edge, I'm still in one. Right. Same vertex, same edge, different face. Now I'm in two. Yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly it. So I'm trying. To, yeah, I'm also trying to extend it to. Three dimensions, so that, that yeah, that also works, works in that case. Dimensions. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, so the Delaney dress symbols do extend to three dimensions, and yeah, and so there is there are uh, there are a number of papers that that we where we looked at three dimensional stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one so, one uh, other yeah uh, one other question. So in the next page, where you talk about the things that we can get from the Delaney dress, yeah, um, yeah. how. Uh, oh, sorry, not the next one. <laughs> how this many one, of yeah. those? Uh, no, that that the last one you were on. Sorry, the, yeah. How many of these can we not get from the orbifold? Because I was just trying to work out the yeah the, the orbifold. Okay, so another way to describe what I've described so far. I was mm. thinking about this that I should really try and change the slides. Is but another way to think of the Delaney dress symbol is really is, is just the triangulation of the orbifold. 
because you've got a triangular instrument with a tiling and you identify stuff using the symmetry group to get, get the orbifold, where you could just identify the triangles and you get a triangulization of the orbifold. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then those invariants that I mentioned, the number of vertices of a node, uh, of a, uh, the number of edges of a, of a face and the vertex degree, it's really, uh, you can figure that out using those uh, corner and uh, gyration values on the triangulization. So it's it is a it's a graph describing triangulization of the orbifold. Yeah, so yeah. So it's a, in a way delaying just symbol you can think of it also as a data structure of orbifolds, but coming from it's a tiling. Much simpler yeah. to you, I assume. And I noticed that I assume that, that tiling was uh star six four three was and I noticed all those numbers were in the in the star six three two, I guess. Six three two yeah, I mean that's uh, okay. So those aren't the same. Okay, that well that answers. No, my it's question. not those numbers. Yeah, there's yeah, yeah no, no, these numbers are not the yeah. So these mm. numbers are uh, it's to do with how many elements uh, uh, in in a connected component multiplied by the rotational degree. So it's it's, it's slightly more com complex. Yeah, I'm also noting that the one the one that I got wrong is the vertex that has more than one type of um yeah two and three around that vertex yeah so, okay thank you i think yeah. think about that yeah well, daniel yeah uh, daniel could you show how you distinct uh, spherical and the uh, presence of euclidean uh, uh, symbol yeah that's coming up exactly. yeah here is exactly. the slide here so so among those uh, advanced curvature uh, well, properties we're going to look at the curvature so this is, we take the elements of the Delaney dress symbol, and then we add up these two numbers, uh, vertex, uh, face degree and vertex degree, and subtract half. Uh, okay, so it's a very simple invariant. And if this comes out to be positive, we know that the, the corresponding tiling is uh, gonna be a spherical tiling. If it's zero, it's gonna be Euclidean. If it's negative, it's gonna be hyperbolic. And so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and so we get we'll get back to that in a moment in more detail. So here's a difficult property. Well, I thought for a while, yeah, I've got an easy way to to determine this, but then my colleague Olaf Gagara said, no, this is this doesn't work, and it doesn't work. So uh, so a lot of things are easy to do with the Delaney dress symbol or the triangulization of the orbifold, but here's a, something that that is not straightforward to do. So let's call a tiling pseudo convex if the intersection of two tiles is either empty or connected. So it's either nothing or it's a vertex or it's an edge. So this is a pseudo convex. Here's an example of something that's not pseudo convex. If I look at these two tiles, A and B, their intersection consists of uh, two points, this vertex here and this vertex here. Okay, and so, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that for some, for some applications, you might want to not allow these. You say, okay, I want my tilings always to be pseudo convex. I don't want any tiles to share two points, uh, two vertices, or a vertex mm -hmm. and an edge somewhere else. And yeah, that's not that. That's not that's, you can't do that just by looking at the Delaney dress symbol. I don't think uh, you do need to have the actual tiling and not not the thing. Okay, so here's the simplest property of Delaney dress symbol: is just the number of elements in that graph. And, and so we'd like to call that the dress complexity of the of the symbol or the tiling. And so let's look at dress complexity one, one element. Okay, so this is what the graph is gonna look like. Those edges have nowhere else to go. So there's gonna be three uh, self edges. And then there's gonna be those two numbers, face degree and no degree And it. Yeah, and then we can discuss what goes on. So let's say for different values of face degree and no degree, uh, that's the that's the formula. Then there's only one node. So this is a formula for the curvature. And if we allow p equals two, that means uh, the face degree is two. I mean, we're talking about digons, nodes that only have two vertices, two edges. So if I plug in a two to the p, and then I look at this formula here, then uh, it, it boils down to one divided by q, the, the vertex degree, and that's always going to be positive. So that tells us something that we would have guessed already, that if you, if you only have... If you have a tiling, very symmetric tiling with only digons, well, it, it can only be of the sphere. You know, like an, it's going to look like a, an orange. I mean, you take the peel off and you see the slices. That's, you know, it's just going to be just 
and oh, it's going to look like an orange. It's always going to be spherical, something like this. You're going to have, you know, uh, a node at the top, a node at the bottom. You're going to have uh, the edges going all the way from top to bottom. And uh, the symmetry group, by the way, is, is going to be star Q22. There's going to be two photo rotation in, uh, in the center of the tiles and one in the center of an edge. And then there's going to be a Q at the top and Q at the bottom. But it's going to be the same Q because you can, yeah, they're symmetry equivalent. So does that make sense? That's a simple. Now forget, we're not going to look at P equals two any further. So let's look at P equals three and Q equals three, plug those in. It's a, that's a six, so that's still, that's still a positive. So it's spherical. And if we plug in three, four or five, this is still spherical. And we get these three tilings. And these are the three symmetry groups. Now, if we go one step further and uh, plug in Q equals six, then we've got a half minus a half, and that's going to be zero. And then we're in the then we're in the Euclidean uh, tilings. And if we replace six by seven, then we're going to go below zero, and then we're we're in the hyperbolic. And yeah, and if we plug in eight, nine, or ten, yeah, just it's just going to be uh, continue to be more and more hyperbolic if you if you're allowed to say that. Yeah. Okay, so we wanted to classify tilings. And the thing about hyperbolic is that there's infinite families. So if star 732 is, uh, so if this is a hyperbolic tiling with this group, well, I could, uh, in this particular case, there's also a tiling like this, this, and this. And so we're gonna define, we're gonna say a tiling is called geometry minimal. If you, if you can't reduce one of these numbers without changing the geometry that you're in, uh, so, so for example, seven three two. If I change, if I make a change that's going to change any of these three digits in the orbifold name, then I'm going to either be Euclidean or I'm going to be spherical. So this is definitely geometry minimal. Whereas this tiling here, which has a tenfold set, has a node of degree ten here, I can change ten by nine. It's still going to be hyperbolic. It's going to be yes. And that's not going to be geometry minimal. And so we need that we need that concept. And also for spherical tilings, there's infinite families that we don't we're not interested in. So the final goal of this, but I guess we're running out of time because huh? it's we finish at three. Uh, yeah. So so the final goal of this would have been to classify tilings uh, uh, up to a certain level of complexity, uh, taking geometry. You know, but only the geometry minimal ones, not looking at infinite families. Yeah. So, so what's so do we end? So, yeah, I'm sorry. If, it's if, taking long. Yeah. If, if you need a few more minutes, Daniel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll carry on. Okay. So now it's about classifying tilings uh, of uh, given dress complexity. So if D equals one. Really, everything is highly equivalent. Everything's highly symm symmetric. Uh, then there's twelve uh, types. Uh, some of these are there's three Euclidean types. Uh, there's a number of hyperbolic, and there's the number of uh, spherical ones. Okay. Uh, and sometimes, and so one thing that you notice in some of these pictures can be hard. To, yeah. Well, I, okay. So that's that's it. That's a complete classification of everything with. Complexity one, complexity two. Uh, there's gonna be, so there's two there's two elements in the Delaney dress symbol, and sometimes they can be in the same tile, and then everything's going to be dark blue. But but there's also you can imagine you know there's going to be tilings where one triangle is in one type of tile and the other one's in the other type, and then you can see two colors. Yeah, there's two equivalence classes of tiles. What you'll also see is that some of these tilings look identical. There's no difference between this guy and this guy, or this guy and that guy, or this one or that one. And uh, and the, the reason for that is that, as I said, we are looking at equivariant tilings. So the, the, the symmetry group is prescribed. Now the algorithm that we developed here to draw the tiling doesn't know that. So sometimes it draws the tiling with too, mu too much symmetry. So things that look similar here, uh, a, a more careful drawing would draw one with less symmetry. That's why a lot of these things look the same. And when you go in there and interact with the tiling, you go into the program and start 
moving points around on the fundamental domain, then you can see that the tiling is different. But in these overview pictures, a lot of them are going to look the same. In any case, there's 50 classes with D. You can see where this is going. D is 3, there's 36. D equals 4, there's 138. D equals 5, there's 82. D equals 6, there's 429. <laughs> D equals 7, there's 369. D equals 8, there's 1265. OK, so how far can we go? Uh, we went up to 24, and there's 2.4 billion tilings uh, with up, uh, up to 24 elements in their Delaney trust symbol. And so this is not a, this is not just a number that we computer. We actually have a big file. It's 300 gig in size, and it contains all these Delaney trust symbols. So it's uh, yeah we you know whether this really is helpful uh, for mathematics, I don't know. But you know we wanted to see how far we can go. And of these 2.4 billion tilings, uh, just over 2 million are spherical, 1.7 million are Euclidean, all the rest are hyperbolic. Uh, okay, so we did this enumeration uh, using a program that Olaf de Garde wrote in Julia. Uh, you know, it's, it's a program in language a bit like Python, but it's uh, more, uh, it's more performant. And, uh, and the other thing, the thing that the, I'm most excited about is this program that I wrote together with uh, Rudy Ostella, who's here in Tübingen, and some students uh, called Tegula. And it and it, what it does is you fire up the program and you give it a database of these Delaney dress symbols, and it will draw the tilings for you. And it uses code that Charles Vesfar, a former school buddy of mine, wrote in 1991 for his diploma thesis for MS DOS. And I, I, I held on to a floppy disk for many years, so I still have that. And yeah, so, so this is what the program looks like. You fire it up, and then there's an interface that allows you to f search for things in the database. So here I said I want four classes of tiles, I want four classes of edges, I want four classes of vertices. And uh, I'm not interested in Euclidean, and I'm not interested in hyperbolic. So this is just searching in a, in a, in a database, finding everything that matches that. And then, then I can scroll through, look at all these tilings that have those properties. And then if I see one that I like, I can double click on it. And then it puts me into this editor where I can then, you know, uh, do different things. For example, I can look at the delay, uh, look at the symmetry group. And if I don't like the symmetries, I can change the four into a five or the five into a six. And you know, I say, now I've got something Euclidean. I can look at the hyper, uh, the fundamental domain and I can, change some aspects of the tiling, you know, within within what the, that particular symmetry group allows me to do. And uh, yeah, Daniel, yeah, when you're deforming your tiling, we are still in the same homeomorphism class, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so only picture changes, but where yeah, it's the and, same. Well, with yeah. that code is the same. Yeah. Now here's a here's a hyperbolic one. Uh, you, you can control how much stuff you get to see. You know, you can, and then there's the Klein model, and there's also the hyper, hyperboloid model. And these three models, they, you know, it's it's only this model. It's just where you put the camera. It depending where you put the camera, it you could you it looks like the Poincaré or the Klein. Uh, you can take out the the. Um, you can take out reflections by pressing that button. I guess it makes the Delaney dress symbol look twice as big. You don't see it here. It's, it, so this is something where you can still see the reflections, but when you look at the fundamental domain, you can see, yeah, I can, you can actually change stuff so that the reflections no longer uh, are present. So that's a, a more, that's a dual uh, tiling that you can, yeah, and then you can do stuff like, I mean, this is not mathematics anymore. This is just too much fun programming stuff where you can change the colors and say, okay, I want to, I don't know, make the edges thicker, give them a different color. Yeah, yeah. so that's, yeah, so, uh, so, uh, so that program, as I said, it, it takes as input a database of Delaney dress symbols, not the one with the up to 24, that's too big, but the one that we have on the webpage goes up to 18 and everything up to Delaney dress, delay, uh, the dress complexity of 18 is in that database. 
and uh, the, there's so there's some algorithms that figure out different properties of the tanning. But the the, what the main algorithm obviously is the one that takes the graph and makes the fundamental domain, uh, so that we can uh, then draw the tiling. So we make a fundamental domain, and then we uh, you know generate symmetries that copy yeah that fundamental domain to get the whole tiling. Yeah, you can, I spend too much time <laughs> with this program, but I make these little glass uh, coasters that I give to people as presents. Everybody I know has got some of those. Yeah. So to summarize, uh, you know, we discussed an orbifold notation through these symmetry groups. And we saw the Delaney dress symbol, which is, a, think of it as a graph that can, describes equivariant tilings up to homeomorphism. You can also think of it as a way of describing the triangulization of the corresponding orbifold. And the idea of a, a galaxy of periodic times was that we looked at everything up to complexity 24 and got a number 2.4 billion. I thought that sounds like uh, how many things are in the galaxy, but apparently a galaxy has way more stars than 2.4 billion. So it's so it's, it's not really a galaxy, but it's still a, a large number of things. And then we have that software that you can use for the displaying tilings. And there's a paper that goes with that. And uh, you, and I was recently contacted by De Declaton. I don't know whether you know Declaton. It's a French uh, outdoor company who make outdoor clothing and so on. And they, they, want, they want me to consult for them as a tilings expert because they want to use tilings in a manufacturing uh, setting where you cut clothing from a piece of cloth and uh, you want to do it in such a way that you, you know, minimize the amount of uh, uh, waste. And... I thought, well, how can tiling help? And the idea is that uh, designers, when they figure out how to piece together a gammon out of uh, pieces that, you know, the fit of the body, you rethink how you cut those uh, uh, pieces uh, or how you put them together so that ideally they tile when you, when you cut them from material. So there is a, that seems to be an application of tiling theory in, in the production of uh, clothing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Please thank Daniel for the beautiful talk. Thanks. Yeah, so physically, virtually. Let me now stop the recording. Yeah.